uh, is convened by the Middle East Institute Syria program in collaboration with New Lines magazine uh, and is entitled The Critical Implications of Syria's Worsening Crisis from Local to Global, a broad title, because uh, I think we'll be covering uh, a, a lot today. The impetus for today's event is the first visit to the United States by uh, the gentleman to my left here, uh, Yassin al Haj Saleh, Syria's acclaimed political thinker. Um, Yassin, we're really thrilled and honored to, to have you here today. Thank you so much to, for coming you. to us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank sure. you, Charles. Um, Syria's multifaceted crisis is now in its 12th year and shows no signs of resolution. Yet, despite more than a decade of debilitating violence and regime brutality, the original ideals of the peaceful uprising that erupted in 2011 also persist as protesters in Sweden and other regions of the country are still demonstrating today on a, on a daily basis. While the Syrian regime has used every tool at its disposal to violently and criminally suppress the peaceful resolution, revolution that began 12 and a half years ago, Syria's civil society, both at home and in the diaspora, has survived and flourished. This and many other realities underline the unique nature of Syria's crisis, fueled and shaped as it is by the regime itself, and also by overlapping and hostile ideological currents, external geopolitical interests, and a wide array of sub and non-state actors. As Yassin himself has argued, it is only by acknowledging this uniqueness of Syria's crisis that Syrians in the world at large might determine how best to resolve it and place the country on a more peaceful, just, and prosperous path. Um, in a moment, we'll hear from Yassin with some opening remarks. Um, but before doing so, I just wanted to briefly introduce him and our fellow panelists uh, who've joined us today. Yassin uh, al Haj Saleh is a Syrian writer, an intellectual, and a former political prisoner. In 1980, while studying medicine at Aleppo University, a then 19 year old Yassin was arrested by Hafez al Assad's regime because of his membership of the Syrian Communist Party. He remained in prison for 16 years until 1996, and since then, has turned to writing on political, social, and cultural subjects relating to Syria and the Arab world. He's a regular contributor to Al Hayat and Al Quds Al Arabi newspapers and the Syrian online periodical Al Jumhuriya. Yassin has also authored and edited uh, a number of books about Syria and co founded uh, Ham Hamish? Hamish? Hamish. 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 I don't speak German. Yeah. Uh, a Syrian cultural house in, in Istanbul, Turkey. Yassin is the author of nine books. And in 2012, he was awarded the Prince Klaus Award, a prize supported by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs that uh, recognizes intellectuals who make extraordinary impacts upon their societies. He was unable to collect the prize as he was living at the time in hiding in Damascus. Yassin is married to Samira Al-Khalil, who was kidnapped and disappeared by an armed Islamist group in Duma outside Damascus in December 2013. And he now lives in Berlin, Germany. Andrew Tabler on the far left uh, is a senior fellow at the Washington Institute, specializing in Syria, the Levant and US Middle East policy. He has a background in Middle East affairs and has held advisory positions within the US State Department and the National Security Council. Before joining the Washington Institute, Andrew lived and worked extensively in the Middle East, contributing to publications and media outlets on Middle East issues. This included a seven year stint living in Damascus from 2001 to 2008, where he co-founded Syria Today, Syria's first English language magazine, serving as its editor in chief. Andrew is also the author of the book, In the Lion's Den, an eyewitness account of Washington's battle with Syria. And then finally, and certainly not uh, least, uh, we have Mona Yakubian joining us today. Mona is the vice president of the Middle East and North Africa Center at the United States Institute of Peace. She brings more than 30 years of experience working on the Middle East and North Africa, with her work centering on conflict analysis and prevention with a specific focus on Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. Her additional research interests include Russia's role in the Middle East, as well as violent extremism and fragility. In 2019, she served as the executive director of the congressionally appointed Syria Study Group. She joined USIP after serving as a deputy assistant administrator in the Middle East Bureau at USAID. Um, and prior to joining USAID, Mona was a senior advisor at the Stimson Center. Um, 
Should also note another touch on, on Syria. Mona was a Fulbright scholar in Syria where she studied Arabic at the University of Damascus in 1985 and 1986. So really, really thrilled to have this fantastic panel, uh, particularly interested and excited to hear from Yassine. Uh, in terms of format today, we'll, we'll have about 20 minutes or so um, of opening remarks from, from Yassine, reflecting on the uniqueness of Syria's crisis and what we can and should learn from it. Um, Yassine will then, uh, I think, engage in a brief conversation with me before we open up to our wider panel uh, to address everything we've heard and maybe uh, also some of the current events that we're witnessing in, in Syria and in the immediate region. Um, to all of those of you online, uh, please feel free to submit uh, your questions to us at any point throughout today's event and we'll do our best to work them into the question and answer session towards the end. So Yassine, thank you again uh, so much for being here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Charles, and thank you for uh, showing up. So, um, as Charles has just said, it is about the uniqueness, the extraordinary nature of the Syrian situation in the last 12 and a half years, 150 months, 151 months. Uh, actually, it is, um, well, I try to, um, to um, link this to a longer period of time and to the nature of the Syrian regime. So, um, in herself, Syria is important only for Syrians because it is their country, the only one they have. But this is no longer true as it was before the revolution and wars in the Middle Eastern country. Paradoxically, Syria has gained significance for non-Syrians. At that time, it has become a hell for most of its population. Some 30% of them are already refugees in 127 countries. Though mostly in six of them, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Germany, Egypt, and Iraq. However, the spread of Syrians to some two thirds of the nations of uh, uh, the planet, and this is uh, this number 127 countries, is from a report by Human Rights Watch published, I guess it was February 22, so a year and a half ago. Maybe we have conquered more countries in the meantime bigger than any empire in the history, I guess. So uh, two thirds of um, the spread of Syrians to some two thirds of the nations of the planet came uh, together with the flooding of their rather small country with liquid, with, uh, what I call liquid imperialism, the US, Russia, and the three, three sub imperial powers of Israel, Iran, and Turkey. By this notion, I try to represent uh, liquid imperialism, a novel condition where many global and regional powers submerge one smaller and weaker country and divide it between them. What I call conquered imperialists, meaning Salafi jihadis who poured in the country after 2012, starting from two, uh, 2012, coming from dozens of countries, are uh, um, uh, in a way still there, though their heydays are already behind them. Uh, the receptive structure of power, colonial in its own right, represented by the Assad family ruled in the last, uh, um, uh, the Assad family ruled in the last 53 uh, years, already more than half of the whole modern history of the Syrian polity. Syria appeared uh, on the, uh, the stage of history uh, after the First World War. So it is one century, five years, 53 of them, a bit more than half, under the Assad family rule. So um, um, th this, this receptive structure of power is the decisive factor in reducing Syria to a non-homeland, a human desert indeed, not only a political one. Uh, I said about the Salafi jihadis conquered imperialists because their imaginary is haunted, so obsessed with the empires of the past, uh, Muslim empires of the past. At the same time, they are conquered, they are weak. They, uh, the political prisoner, the global political prisoner in the last three decades, uh, I guess, is, uh, is an Islamist. Before that, it was a communist, as, as you know. So, other than states, the country hosts many sub-state actors. Apart from the Sunni jihadism, which has always been a, globali a globalizing 
uh, phenomenon since its appearance in the history uh, stage in Afghanistan after the Soviet invasion in 1959 and the Shia jihadism, some of whose organizations appeared almost at the same time after the Iran revolution, 79 as well, both are there in the country. Though there is an authoritative center in Tehran for the Shia one, um, unlike the Sun, uh, this is Sunni uh, 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 counterpart. However, Shia jihadists came from many countries to fight uh, for the regime. Lib from Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and others. There have been some Christian jihadis, so to speak, who came at least from France and Greece, as well as adventurous individuals from other countries here. Yeah. PKK is also in Syria, uh, sharing with the Turkish government, exporting the civil war in Turkey to Syria under the watchful eyes of the US. So it is not only states and their alliances in Syria, it is also religions and sub-state actors. We don't know many countries whose population is scattered in the world and much of the world is inside their country. With this condition in mind, Syria is a microcosm, maybe the only one we have today, or possibly the most representative country of the uh, world today. In other words, Syria is not a country over there. It is a country over here, wherever here and there are. The country is divided into four parts. One is an Assad protector dominated by Iran and Russia. One is dominated by the Americans and a third by Turkey and a fourth by the conquered imperialists. Golan Heights have been occupied by Israel since 1967. The division of Syria and the condition of liquid imperialism where big powers coexist uh, in one smaller country go together. Sorry, the division of Syria and the condition of uh, liquid imperialism where big powers coexist in one smaller country go together hand in hand. With these five imperialist and sub-imperialist powers in the country, open bullied Syria has quite slim chances to survive. By contrast, this open bullied condition seems to have provoked a widespread tendency to firmly close state bullies everywhere. The ascendance of right-wing populism and genocratic movements everywhere can be read as another symptom. Uh, uh, by genocracy and genocratic, I mean the rule or the movements centered around genos as opposed to demos. Uh, uh, white supremacy, uh, 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 Hinduism in India, Islamism in the Middle East, uh, the Arab world, uh, the Muslim world, Zionism, and Zionism is plus, which is extremely right-wing. Uh, 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 the Russia, Russian nationalism with it is uh, great Caesarian past and orthodox, uh, orthodoxy are all genocratic movements and tendencies. Uh, the right-wing populists in Europe. So these are symptoms of this um, 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 to um, control your bill, your being. In the Middle East, regimes like Egypt, like the Egyptian and Jordanian, have already been blackmailing their population into political conformism, lest they become like Syria. During more than 150 months, Syrians experienced what can be possibly the broadest spectrum of human suffering, torture, rape, massacres, destruction of local communities, forced evacuation and forced disappearances, dispersion of families in many countries without being able to meet again. The country under Assad family has been a torture state for decades. Syria is the second civil war where uh, planes, uh, war, war planes uh, were used only after Spain, I guess. Uh, barrel bombs is the original destructive signature of the um, regime military and is far more destructive than chemical weapons where bodies remain at least in one piece. 
SCAD muscles were um, may well have been used only in our internal conflict, as uh, as it is always labeled by uh, you uh, by, by international uh, bodies. Chemical weapons have been used so many times with the massacre of August twenty one, um, uh, two thousand thirteen, being the biggest. The Russians have been good in using cluster munitions and phosphorus bombs against hospitals and uh, markets and civilian facilities. And with 30% of the population scattered everywhere, the country is reduced to a human desert, as I mentioned above. What should be uh, shocking to everybody is that the world has lived with a huge level uh, of suffering and misery. Um, with a quite ignominious apathy and senselessness, as if the whole world is numb with narcotics, maybe. I believe that this condition will be only consolidated by uh, the ongoing war in Gaza. We have already seen so many signs of rising tribal uh, civilizationism, with it is othering and dehumanizing effects. It has been always there, this, this uh, 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 machine of othering and dehumanization, but it's a growing exponentially, uh, its effects uh, are growing exponentially in the last two weeks and a half in the West. It is, disrespect, it is disrespectful not to focus on the human suffering and losses uh, in Syria, to go back to Syria. At last half a million dead, Actually, we have been say, uh, saying this for five years, mm -hmm. half a million. We are stopping there for fear of exaggeration. I guess it is 600 or 700,000, but we don't have uh, concrete proofs of this. More than 130,000 of unknown fate, uh, uh, people of unknown fate, 7 million refugees, uh, yeah, ETC. Famine is already there with more than 90% of the population living under poverty line. However, by focusing on these dimensions, uh, on this humanitarian dimension, we tend to push aside consequential tectonic changes that might very well take place on the level of political entities and with which the world will live for decades. Taking uh, shape these uh, changes, um, a long-term multi-level instability, social, political, geopolitical, geographic, demographic, and not least the spiritual. I'll not go into detail about this, but I think it is uh, very interesting and um, it should be, it should uh, earn more interest. And because of the huge scale of what has happened and is still happening, I think Syria has a potential to revolutionize political thought on three levels. First, rethinking colonialism and nationalism. Second, rethinking state tyranny and democracy. And third, rethinking religion and humanism. It is no longer sufficient to reduce colonialism to Western one, which is still there. And as we have seen in the last 18 days, it is, it is still extremely brutal. It is, it is still it is still racist. It is still uh, uh, complicit with genocides and destruction. I mean, I don't want to relativize it. I wrote this before, I guess, but uh, um, so it, it is not meant to relativize Western uh, uh, colonialism, but there are other colonies. But this is my point. However, with the Iranian and Russians in Syria seizing the resources and using the regime to serve uh, their interests, their own interests. Uh, a reassessment of imperialism and colonialism and national revelation is urgently needed. And I guess this many Ukra Ukrainian would, would support uh, this uh, idea of rethinking imperialism and colonialism. This applies on Turkey also, I mean, not only Iran and Russia, whose agents are exploiting the resources of the areas that they control in northeastern Syria. I am myself from there and I have yeah, I have uh, first resources, uh, first sources about uh, um, Turkish agents uh, seizing, uh, uh, exploiting the resources of that region. 
the traditional talk about authoritarianism and dictatorship is no longer useful. So this is the second, uh, the second issue. What we face starting from Syria is not just monopoly of power, but a new sultanic rule, a new sultanic rule and a new di the dynastic buildup, which means privatization of the state and monopoly of the society itself. This is far more reactionary and exterminish, extermi exterminationist and with millennial component as well. Uh, millennial governments are always uh, um, um, genocidal, mostly. I mean, the Nazis. The, um, um, under the Middle East, everybody, almost all the these genocratic movements are millennial. Salafi Islamism, and this is the third issue, is as it appeared in Syria, has been nihilist social and annihilationist and by no means just conservative uh, political Islam. Violence is organically constituent of, of it. So, so they don't practice violence actually, they are, they are violence in a way. Islamism, uh, Islamism in general has proved itself to be politically catastrophic and much will be said about this after this new round of war in Gaza. With these three insurmountable obstacles that cut the way to freedom, the Arab Middle East is the space of the world political proletariat. The people who are the least free on the globe. Maybe we share this with the Kashmiris and uh, Rohingya and uh, yeah, I believe other communities. It is very radical uh, a very radical condition when you have these three enemies of freedom, Syria and, and in a different way, Palestine, are symbols of a freedom in the world. The whole Arab enemy is the most unfree part of the world today because of this colonial, tyrannical, and theocratic triangle. What can be built on this is that the emancipation of the political proletariat can be the greatest leap forward in the global struggle for freedom. That's why Syria is important. Thank you. Great. Gosh, Yassine, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, uh, let me first start by saying or responding in terms of, and I think a lot of what you described today when it comes to Syria was describing a, a regime that, as you say, has been around for more than 50 years uh, and a regime that has acted and designed in such a way, designed itself in such a way to, have co to exert complete control over Syria and over the society. And you use the term monopoly of society. Um, <clears throat> and I think few people would, would debate that. But in current, in current days, there's been an active debate about whether or not everything in Syria today is controlled by Assad <clears throat> or, or that very little is actually controlled by him. He's created such destruction and chaos that actually his authority is very limited. I wonder if maybe you have some thoughts on He's on not in control of his own fate. I mean, how, when mm -hmm. Iran and uh, Russia um, are dominant, they are dividing the state itself between themselves. Mm -hmm. The um, Amnid Dawla, the, the state security, we have four main security agencies, Amn al-Dawla, state security, Amn al-Askari, uh, uh, military security, Amn al-Siyasi, political security, and Amn al-Jawi, uh, the Air Force, Air Force. Air Force security. Yeah. Uh, so these are the main. Uh, uh, Amn al-Dawla, the state security, is closer to the Russians, and al-Askari is closer to the Iranians. Al-Furq al rabaa the fourth division led by Mahr al-Assad, who's brother of uh, Bashar, is closer to the Iranians and uh, never uh, tiger forces of uh, Hassan, what was his name? Suhail. Yeah, Suhail Hassan, <laughs> yeah, uh, is closer to the Russians. So, um, but Bashar is very, still, I mean, Bashar doesn't control his uh, own fate, but he is very important. He has the name, he has the brand of the, um, of the Assad rule. It is not enough to be from the Alawite community. Uh, that control uh, that has a um, special weight, very big in comparison of its uh, demographic weight in, 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 the, in the military and in security. 
it is the asset family. It is this thing. And the only other uh, alternative is Maher, his brother, who is uh, the king of Captagon now and the leader of the, uh, of the fourth division. So it is a paradoxical situation. Uh, the regime doesn't, cannot reproduce itself independently from the, these uh, uh, dominant powers. And of course, the, the, the role of Hezbollah also is, is quite big. Um, um, at the same time, I don't see that Bashar or the Assad family are challenged by, by the Russians or the Iranians. Or, so uh, as we see, it is still uh, the same situation as um, most probably it will remain and the, uh, until we see some big shift. And I guess after uh, after what's happening in Gaza, I don't see that any parties are interested in affecting or in changing anything in Syria. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see that in the last few weeks, uh, after the Homs, uh, mm-hmm. after um, almost 80, I guess, of the regime military, um, uh, young military men, um, were killed by a vague attack that the regime and the Russians have been attacking Idlib. But it is, I don't see that this is, this will lead to invasion or to radical change in the situation of the northwestern part of right. the country. Yeah. So it's frozen as, as still. Most probably, right. this is what I think. Yeah. So one, one other sort of broader question on something which uh, so I listened to your uh, your event at Georgetown the other day, and one of the one of the terms um, or concepts you talked a lot about was politicide. Yeah. Which, if I understood it correctly, essentially, is, or maybe you can explain politicide first, yeah. and then I'll then make to make sure I'm not wrong, yeah. and then I'll ask the question. <laughs> well, 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 it, it, it was a uh, term coined in nineteen, I guess, nineteen eighty seven or nineteen eighty eight by two American political scientists. <laughs> Ted Gurr and Barbara Harf to, um, um, well, as something to um, represent issues not represented by the UN Convention mm. of 1948 to prevent and to punish genocide, uh, the crime of genocide. You know, uh, that convention, uh, um, what was meant by genocide is to target ethnic or national or racial or religious group as such. Um, so what about political groups, parties? The, the big example that Harf and uh, Gurr gave was the Indonesian Communist Party, where at least half a million of people were killed because of their political affiliation. So port side is the term that they coined to represent this, uh, this condition. In a way, we were persuaded uh, as parties. So, well, I, I use the term, according to Harf and Ger, persuade is to kill people politically. I use the term rather as kill people, uh, sorry, their, their, their coinage was to kill people for political reasons. Mm-hmm. In my usage, it is more to kill people politically without necessarily killing them physically, like, uh, we left us in Syria. We are killed politically. Ninety uh, percent of our of our parties were in jail for very long years, and some were killed actually. Not big numbers, unlike Islamists, where big numbers of them were were killed. So um, we were politicized in this meaning, and the Syrian society at large was uh, uh, politicized, killed politically denied any political representation, any free autonomous uh, 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 um, parties or organization that represent the population. So this was, this is what I meant about it. Okay, so I'm glad you explained it a lot better than I would have done. So my, my question really was, so I sort of heart myself back to, I think it must have been around 2012, Sir, uh, a Syrian who I knew very well, uh, an older gentleman from Aleppo, used to always say to me how tragic it was that, in his opinion, Syrians had spent so long under the Assad family's rule that 
he didn't use the word politicized, but what he was describing was Syrians political agency, the Syrians ability to engage in anything that might be politics, little local politics or big national politics, has, has, had, had never existed for so many decades that when the uprising happened in 2011, the ability to turn what should have been experience in any form of politics into something that mattered, that could be unified and meaningful and strategic, didn't exist. Um, so the first part of my question is, do you agree? The second part of my question is, I said in my opening remarks how I think Syrian civil society inside Syria, amidst all of this brutality and suppression, has persisted. And even in regions like Sweda, you know, persisted and come back to the forefront 12 and a half years later. Um, does that mean that perhaps politicide uh, doesn't fit in the sense that that form of politics, civil society activism, has managed to, you know, be birthed and survive amidst all of this violence. And in many ways, that, that the ideals that they are representing are exactly the ideals that most Syrians would want to be at the forefront. Yeah, yeah so uh, I like this question. So, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, I agree with the uh, Alepian uh, gentleman uh, <laughs> diagnosis. Actually, at times I feel that we lost this faculty of organized, uh, mm -hmm. politically organized, and maybe the uh, organization and the level of civil society can be can replace this, uh, at least uh, partly. So uh, look, um, the Ba'ath Party has been ruling Syria for 60 years, 60 years and a half now. And 96% of Syrians are under 60. So we were all, almost everybody who was born in the Ba'athist era at 53 years of this era under the Assad family. So I think this explains a lot. So one party system for a very long time with waves of extreme brutality. It started actually in the same year of 1963, uh, where um, uh, um, many officers, Nasserist officers were killed um, against some Islamists in Hama and who who held a sit in in Sultan Mosque in the city. Uh, and then, then uh, when I was uh, uh, at the university, uh, where thousands, tens of thousands were arrested, tortured, and others, tens of thousands were killed, uh, you know, Hama in uh, uh, February 1982, then the revolution. So there's um, a generational. Mm -hmm a big wave of oppression, torture, killings, massacres. And this has, in, has eradicated actually the all organized political um, groups in, in, in the country. So yeah, I agree with this. But look, we have in the last 12 years, we have a big school for re reclaiming politics, for building organizations, for, it, there's a paradox, another paradox about the Syrian revolution. So it was the most crushed and the, the failed, we failed. Unlike, in a way you can say, in Egypt something was achieved. And I think in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Yemen, something big achieved is to prevent the decline to hereditary monarchies. All of these states in Egypt, Mubarak was preparing Allah. In Tunisia, uh, Zel Abedin was preparing his son in law because he didn't have uh, uh, male uh, sons. In Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh was preparing his son. In Libya, there's no one, Saif al Islam was the, the, the vice, <laughs> vice ruler. So this, this, is, this is a big thing. When you look at Syria and see what the the, the huge price what we've been paying, you realize that it was good. I mean, none of these countries are in a very good shape now, and Libya and Yemen are in extreme situation, almost like Syria, but something was achieved. In Syria, no, we were crushed. And, but at the same time, so the other phase of the paradox is that 
we, the, the revolution achieved a lot because there is uh, 40 millions, which is uh, maybe 60% of the population living outside the control of the regime, whether in neighboring countries or in the areas not controlled by the regime. And now maybe half a million, more than half a million in Sweden uh, are appearing. And they, so the level of organization, the level of initiatives, the level of, uh, uh, of, of actualizing citizenship in a way is also very big and unprecedented. So this is, this gives you an example of what could free Syria have been if we, in a way, in a miracle, we were able to topple the regime in 2012, <laughs> early 13, maybe. So yeah, it is, uh, and it is amazing what's happening in Sweden. Uh, it is a continuation at the same time learning from the lessons and uh, the experiences in the last uh, more than 12 years, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Mona and Andrew, thanks for patiently waiting by the wayside. I'm hoping you have lots of things to, to <laughs> add. I'm really just going to sort of throw a softball at you, which is just aimed at reflecting on a lot of what you've heard and on, and on your views on <clears throat> looking back at what's happened in Syria. Mm. I mean, not just over the past 12 and a half years, but as, as Yassine just said, the generational nature of, of uprisings and repression. Um, but you've both spent considerable time in the region and in Syria, um, I'm sure you must have your own sort of personal experiences that can draw on uh, some of Yassine's reflections. So why don't we start with, with Mona first and, and move to Andrew. Great, thank you, Charles. And, and thanks to MEI and, and News Alliance for sponsoring this. And it's a real honor, Yassine, to be sitting next to you. So I'm glad you asked that because I found myself uh, in my mind, going back to my days as a student uh, in Syria, when I was listening to Yassin talk about politicide in particular, and then Charles, your comments, and immediately what came to my mind, what I remembered is, and I was a student auditing courses living uh, in the Medina Jamia in the dorms at the uh, Damascus University, um, that even the word, and I was struck by this, and I was 22 years old, so I was a kid myself, but struck by the fact that the word politics was mamnu, you don't, yeah, you don't yeah, say it, yeah. the word yeah. politics. Yeah. And I think if I'm, if memory serves me, there was not even uh, a political science department because of the same idea. And as an so American- So you are referring to what years? 85. 86, so I'm aging, dating myself here, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> whoa, but <laughs> I've never been on a panel and talked about this, but, but it's so relevant because it really struck me as re you were speaking, the, the ways in which um, the Syrian population was, had such a stranglehold, even on thought, on words, the, the, the pervasiveness of the Muhabarat everywhere, um, and so that even the word <laughs> politics, imagine that, imagine living in an era and a time where you can't utter the word for fear. I mean, of course, people were talking and things, but it, it gave you a sense of just how um, pervasive this fear was. And the, I, and the only other reflection I have on this is that the only demonstrations or, you know, uh, efforts that sort of uh, any kind of political action were those that were orchestrated by the regime. So that I remember myself as an American student, but living in the dorms, being marched out and being forced, compelled to take part in a demonstration, in this case, on my own embassy, which was rather <laughs> humorous. Uh, but it gives you the sense of how locked down everything was and, and how terrified people were uh, and that there was informing from family members, everybody is a member or many people were members of the Ba'ath Party, et cetera. And so listening to you, I'll, I'll just conclude with this, I could go on, but I, I won't. But listening to the conversation you just had, it really struck me, uh, wow, how damaging that was in terms of when the moment of a thawra arrived, that the population was struggling with so much. I mean, it's too, it's too difficult in a way 
to go from zero to 60, I guess, uh, in, in without having had the benefit of um, a culture of political thought and action. Um, can I comment? Yeah, sure, and then, yeah. and then we'll go to Andrew. Yeah. yeah. So this was three years after Hama, yeah, exactly. where 20 to 30 percent of the uh, 30,000 of the population were killed in February 82. It was, it came just a few years after thousands of people were arrested and tortured, myself included. I was, uh, it was late 1980 when I was arrested. So there were communists from two parties, they were Islamists and they were dealt with far more brutally, to be honest, from us, and others. And the society was infiltrated by informers. So your colleagues were afraid of the uh, world of, of siasa or politics because, because it, there could well be some informers around you. Uh, uh, these are secret informants. So the Syrian society was mined by informers and security operations. So uh, uh, I don't know how to translate this into English. Mona, what do you think? When there's a mine and yeah, so 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 that uh, um, a society that's threatened to explode when it yeah. rebels, and, and we we've been seeing. Uh, seeing this. So politics in Syria was about two things, about talking, about speech, uh, about uh, public issues, and about gathering. Mm -hmm. In my yeah. work, yeah, I focus on this. It is, it is, it is this. It is. The Damascus Spring was exactly gatherings of people in dozens or mm -hmm. few hundreds talking about politics openly, but were in private spaces, not in squares, not in uh, uh, cultural centers, not, no, it was, uh, uh, it was in homes of uh, Jamal Atasi, the late Jamal Atasi or Riyad Saif or, or these people. Um, and that's why religion came to play uh, an important political role because there was an opinion that even the brutal regimes cannot suppress, which is scriptures, which is which is uh, holy texts. And there is one gathering that they cannot disband, disband which is gathering of, of believers in mosques or, or churches uh, for, for to pray. So, and this is the vicious thing about it. In a way, religion was giving people agency and it was a political, it was a language of protest. At the same time, the ideal is not emancipatory. So okay. yeah, and I guess this helps us understand some dynamics that we, we've we seen in the last um, 12 years and a half. So yeah, this is very relevant to your mm. uh, observation. I was there and it is uh, even in jail, uh, and mm. this is funny and uh, tragic actually, even in jail, uh, Many people, we were communists and we were quite critical and quite open and 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 expressing ourselves in jail. I mean, it, it was actually the only free space in the country in the 1980s. But but we were not only communists uh, at that time. Uh, uh, we were not only communists. Uh, individuals, citizens arrested for some reason. Some of them would spend weeks or months or few, or few years, they were afraid of us because they, they thought that we were trapping them. We were quite critical because we just, we were informers or, or things like this. So no, no free space in the country in, that, in those uh, last two decades and now since the beginning of the present. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Andrew, over to you. You know, uh, it, first of all, Charles and the MEI and the New Lines, thank you for organizing this. It's great to be on a panel with uh, Yassine. I first met Yassine in, I think, 2003 or 2004. I can't remember with a common friend of ours. Um, 
and um, I know about his history in depth, um, and I really appreciated his comments today. I thought they were both, um, I think they were both detailed to the Syrian situation, but also zoomed out mm -hmm. to allow us to look at the overall context. So, you know, I've spent a long time working on Syria policy. Um, probably the only good thing of the Syrian war, if you can call it good, but whatever, is that now you have many Syrians who are outside of their countries who are available to speak with us about their own experiences. And that is always better um, than I think um, those who are not from Syria doing so, because it gives us an idea about their own aspirations and a little bit about themselves, which I think is very important when you're building a state in a nation or a, a state from a nation. Um, so what this, one of the things I do to um, distract myself from the, both the problems that have generated from the Syrian war in the Middle East in general, but also from a lot of the experiences I had in government trying to deal with Syria policy and also to a certain extent, the Syrian opposition was I do a lot of work on genealogy in my own family. And my family is in America uh, after the 30 years war. Uh, we were, things happened more slowly then, but uh, the majority of people in the United States, I believe still, well, whatever, the largest group is of German descent, so to speak, or if, at least on the, on the forms that they're now filled out, but a, a huge number, particularly in the early stages of the Republic. And so in getting reacquainted with my German cousins more recently, I came to understand um, a little bit more about um, what was once a divided polity and about about the effects of the 30 years war on them. And, and I was able to compare it with what I hear in see out of Syria. Uh, and I can tell you that I think absolutely, I recognize the trauma that the Syrian people have suffered from uh, as a result of the war, uh, as, but as well as the Assad regime uh, whose authoritarian um, methods, um, interestingly, heavily introduced by the East German government into Syria in an earlier stage, um, how it damaged society. Um, and, and, and in trying to explain this to others, um, I, I think one of the, one of the problems is as, as experts, you can always hear on TV whenever there's something about Syria, which is now less and less, mm -hmm. uh, everybody always talks about how complicated it is. Well, it is complicated, but actually our job as experts is to try and make things um, digestible to people so that they understand it. So oftentimes my research assistants, one of whom is in the room or others will say, can you point us to like a movie? What was it like to live in Syria when I lived there between 2001 and 2008? And it gets us back to the German experience. And there's a very, gr there's a great film uh, the Lives of Others, uh, Das Leben der Anderen, uh, which is an excellent film mm -hmm. that talks about the DDR, the, yeah. the German Democratic Republic, and it's, it's uh, in its very last days and how it manipulated society. And I think it's important to look at this because the DDR did manipulate German society, East German society in particular, and the way that they did it was that they exacerbated already existing divisions within those societies, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is where it's both tragic in the Syrian case and also hopeful at the same time. Yes, the Assad regime manipulates horribly the divisions within Syrian society, and they do so in brutal ways and they do so in subtle ways. I think, I don't know if Yassin wrote this or someone else, they talked about the was it the Mohabarat of the ropes of silk and nails of steel or something like that, I think was a way to describe it. And I thought that was quite accurate because it was very manipulative. Hmm. Um, and that of course created this trauma. But I can tell you from speaking with my German cousins and doing my own thought and thinking about this, the, the story of humans and the building of nations, ones that function and states that function is not about trauma. That trauma informs something else and that what it does is it's about human resilience. Mm -hmm. And I think Syrians in general have been unbelievably resilient in the face of all of this slaughter. 
But interestingly, when you mentioned about politicide, mm -hmm. however, I think it's important for all Syrians in the opposition and otherwise to understand this trauma, but also understand that the divisions within your within Syrian society, it's important to overcome those because it makes the regime's authoritarianism, which is incredibly efficient in this environment, it makes it less and less powerful. Yep. And I think this was something that really struck me in my last days in government when I was in charge, well, along with others in reaching out to the Syrian opposition, which is, still remains incredibly divided. Mm -hmm. And, you know, absent a, and I think Yassine explained this very well, uh, about Syria being divided between these different armies. We had the five armies model in mm -hmm. when I was in government. The, you've heard Ambassador Jeffrey talk about this. There's a lot of truth in that. And that, that has come in to impose its own order on Syria for, for a variety of reasons that don't have to do with it. Um, but I think it's important as Syrians and those who work on Syria policy to work together to, to recognize that trauma, but at the same time overcome it. What can be done in the, near, in the near term in this divided polity to affect an outcome that doesn't end us up with Assad in the end, that takes more and more cards away from him? And I have to say that I haven't heard a lot about it, but I think it's a discussion worth having very publicly. Um, but also, most importantly, and uh, Yassin put his finger on it, probably the most sensible thing to do is to have it privately so that you can have these private conversations, not like today, but something maybe smaller, <laughs> and that you can overcome these things and then, and then work towards a better future. I realize that's a bit optimistic, but I still think it's important to emphasize uh, yeah. as we overcome this horrific war that, as Charles pointed out at the beginning, has no end in sight. Yeah, I, I would just say just to sort of reflect on that and before I throw another question is what was in a in a different life before I joined think tanks, um, <laughs> I was, you know, neck deep involved in track 1.5 negotiations, bringing Syrians together from all circles. Um, <laughs> and that was back in, you know, 2013, 14, 15, 16, the height of the conflict, the, the, the most severe times of, of war, where the assumption, the assumptions being made from the outside was that you know, the, the division of conflict was just something that could never be gotten over. And there were Syria was divided by sect, it was divided by politics, it was the regime and everybody else. Uh, and these were, you know, obstacles that nobody could ever tide over, which is kind of what you're getting to, Andrew. But in those three and a half years, we had, you know, I still can't sort of reveal all the minute details, but we brought together the widest possible spectrum of Syrians from Salafi jihadists Thank you. To, <laughs> to, <laughs> to communists, to people acting on behalf of the regime, to every major tribe, to every sect, every ethnicity, uh, to the business. That's community. why it didn't work. Well, well, no, no, no. I, I was going to get to this though, but yeah. surprisingly, surprisingly, oh, in a neutral space, like you're talking about, Andrew, taking it out of uh, an environment in which those divisions are exacerbated. Mm. In a private space, it took about a day before mm. everybody was exchanging phone numbers, uh, wishing each other's families well, and suddenly the bitterness of the conflict almost didn't exist. Um, and you could, we strategically placed people who were the furthest away from each other in terms of what was happening inside Syria, sat next to each other uh, for exactly that reason. So yes, of course, when it came to translating that into official talks, the divisions came back. But as humans, again, what you were getting to Andrew, as human beings, um, the, the, the areas of Syrian unity were suddenly became much more visible. So I think there's, you know, there's a lot of problem. Hopefully there was a lot of truth. To but but the problem said. has never been that we Syrians right. were not able yeah, to exactly. meet and talk. Exactly. Never. That's exactly it. It is that we were oppressed. Yeah. 
uh, um, arrested, tortured, slaughtered, uh, insulted, <laughs> discriminated against for a very long time. It is not that we were failing and we need someone to bring us, uh, right. us together. Of course, we have problems like any other societies on these levels, and there are sectarian prejudices, uh, regional prejudices, and the Alepians would say bad things about the Damascene, and here we have an example. <laughs> and the, 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 jokes, the, the jokes were always about Homs and Hama. <laughs> Homs and Hama, and the Homsi is the guy who most of jokes, and Shawaya, Shawaya are the rural Arabs of the uh, northeastern part of the country. I am from are thought always there are stereotypes about them, underdeveloped, <laughs> and whatever. Of course, they, these uh, were there, but um, at the same time, yeah. They were not everything that was there for mixing, talking, exchanging, uh, uh, exchanging words, uh, thoughts, uh, uh, things, mm -hmm. and humans. I mean, there were mixed marriages between between sex and between, yeah. between ethnicities. Not as it should be, but it was there. So the problems that we were denied citizenship for a very long time, and we were without having a tradition of political debate and institutions, Syria came to the history just as a, a century. And have, it is not like Egypt. It is not like Yemen in a way. It is not like Iraq. It is the Arab nationalists would say about Syria, it is an artificial country. And that's true, actually. But most of the world, of the countries in the world, uh, nations are artificial in a way. And, but we can overcome this, this artificial element by developing rights and institutions and by people uh, having rights to, uh, they can so they can uh, uh, they can mix they can talk they can meet the most dividing institute in syria is the army mm -hmm. the army of course syrians uh, male syrians would come from every uh, 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 sector of the syrian society but the, their their eyes are open to the sectarian yeah. divisions, mostly in the army. They are initiated. It is a school of how to sectarianize people, the national army. The second, I'm sorry to say, is the university. Mm. Instead of bringing people together, you see the discrimination with your own eyes, and you see the ones who are empowered by the relation the regime threatening others and so it is, it is this look for a long for for two generations more than two generations this uh, the port side this uh, um, destruction of political organization has led to precise uh, uh, what we say uh, what we call in arabic the communitarian the 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 uh, society of tribes and sects and these things. Mm. When communists, the uh, communist groups in Syria, you in you find Arabs and Kurds, Muslims and Christians, Sunnis and Alawites and Druze and Ismailis. And by the way, uh, before 1948, you would find mm. some Jews. There were some Jews in, in Syria as well. So when you destroy such a political organization, people would return to their uh, tribes and sects. Bath Party itself uh, brought together, uh, because it was a secular Arab national, uh, nationalist, so uh, uh, Christians and uh, Muslims and all the uh, uh, Islamic uh, sects. Oh, the Ba'ath itself has been destroyed since the early days of the Ba'ath rule in Syria. I mean, uh, it, it became a tool of power, and uh, so, uh, in a way, uh, an additional security apparatus to to and informers and these things. So this is the, the the what is what can be good to overcome these divisions is to have political and social uh, life free. Separation. People would come and would find the solution and would build organizations. And it's already happening uh, now on the level of civil society. I guess you know about Madania, who brought yeah. some 200. It is not a political alliance, it is a civil society umbrella. But there are 
uh, some political parties not not growing healthy, I would say, because of the conditions of exile, but they are bringing people from very different backgrounds mm. and very good will. So this is the thing, uh, Charles. I know uh, in, in, in Germany as well, there's a guy, uh, Gerlach, uh, mm. who also bring Syria, as if Syrians don't, don't, don't come together if it were not for someone who brings them. No, it is not this. It is it is a matter of values and rights and citizenship. This is the thing. This it, it, we have a cause. We have a political cause. It is cause to reown our country mm. and to be citizens in our country. So this is the thing. Um, I'm sorry to I'm a bit emotional about this, but I don't think that this uh, service good our cause. To be honest. No, well, thank you for, I think you put a message much more eloquently that I was trying to make, which is that it was unnecessary. Mm. And all of those efforts, whether it's Syrian led or not, the regime, once the regime becomes an active player, it all breaks down. So the regime was the obstacle, at least that was the message I was trying to get to. But I think what you say is, 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 uh, is, is entirely right. Um, I'm going to put one more question to the three of you uh, before we open up to, to some questions. Um, and it's on an issue that I think all three of you have more or less either directly or indirectly touched upon, but you've all used the word generational in one way or the other. Um, and uh, here's where I'm going to put my hat on hat on from where I look at. I have been looking at Syria, which was more about the, 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 the violence and the conflict. But in terms of generations, what struck me the most in studying all of the groups that you, uh, uh, you know, rightly are are, uh, are opposed to in all number of reasons. But in 1980, many Syrians were expelled or exiled, right? And the children of many of those Syrians ended up founding the Islamist and Salafi groups that fought the regime in that that were the earliest groups <laughs> that fought the regime in 2011. Many of them were. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Europe, in other areas around the world, and they fled to Syria the second that they were able to in, in, uh, in you know, mid to late 2011 and created these groups. And that is, at least in, in my observation, one generational sort of impact in terms of the expulsion. Yeah. Another one is, would or could be, and I'd be interested if you agree, is, you know, the effects of all of the many years of suppression of leftist politics of just simple, you know, dissidents and opponents, uh, many of the, the originators of the Damascus Spring, many of those names, and you listed a few of them earlier, you know, ended up creating the political opposition. That was another sort of generational experience that then formed something new in the 2011 revolutionary moment. So my, my question is really whether or not what we've seen witnessed in Syria for the past 12 and a half years is at some point in the future going to give birth to another mm. generational response and what that might be, or has what we've seen over the past 12 and a half years done something different where really what we've seen is something that will persist. The civil society that we've described awakening and reuniting. Um, so really just whether or not we will see a generational wave effect or not out of the past 12 years? For, in my opinion, actually, even before the revolution, I wrote something about the generational crisis in Syria. It was the formative one after the First World War, and it ended by the French colonialism. Uh, France occupied Syria in 1920 for 26 years. Then the era of coup d'etat, a, um, a very young country, without institutions and uh, very much politicized before the politicized came. So uh, many coup d'etat, you know, in 1948, there were three coup d'etat in, in, in Syria. So every three years, there is a big crisis. In 19, late 1970s, the third big crisis that uh, I, I was a, uh, a student at uh, the time. So. Uh, and yeah, we, I mentioned something about it, and it 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 was culminated by Hama uh, massacre, and it took. I will add uh, a third example to the examples uh, you gave about the generational thing. It took thirty years for the Syrian uprising after Hama. Yeah. I mean, 
And it was not led by the people like us who were young and the, uh, 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 the big wave of struggle in late 1970s. It was led by people uh, uh, now in their mid thirties, they were early twenties or even in their late teens or these were the, because they didn't have the conditional reflexes that were, uh, that were, uh, th that, affected uh, uh, my generation. So, so um, uh, I believe that now, of course, now this doesn't have a, um, a, um, a predictable a value. Uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to find the, so this doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't have, it is not a tool to help us predict because the mm -hmm. struggle or the, the huge trauma, the huge tragedy that has been happening for long years is very big, qualitatively different. And um, yeah, so I, I cannot predict, but I believe that if the country survives, um, if we don't have solutions in the coming years, mm. there will be. Um, a, a new big wave of struggle. I don't, I cannot say how it will take shape, but for sure it's happening. There are millions of people whose rights and whose uh, dignity is um, ignored and they'll, they'll come to struggle someday soon. Okay. Maybe it'll take mm. 20 years from now. Mm. No? So I, on the specifics of your question, Charles, I don't know that I actually have much to add to what Yassine just said. Uh, I mean, if someone as as deep and knowledgeable about Syria as Yassine is saying he can't predict, trust me, I can't either. <laughs> but I think to me, what what is critical in this discussion that I think we need to underscore and what Yassine's prepared remarks reminded me of and even the rest of this discussion is, is just how consequential Syria is. And that um, I think I love, in a way, that it's tragic, but I love the way you put it, Yassine, about Syria is us and we are Syria. The, the flows out, the displacement out of Syria to so many countries, the crowding into Syria uh, of, armed, of armed actors um, really underscores that um, this country, by virtue of its location, by virtue of its culture, by virtue of so many, this is truly a crossroads of civilizations, truly, truly. Um, and, and that to me underscores just how consequential what happens in Syria is. And we all know this here in Washington where we, you know, Vegas rules, you can't, don't apply in Syria and we can't ignore it even though this town does. But um, I think that for me, that, that is an important takeaway. And, and the only other comment I, I would say, which I was reflecting on again, with, as Yassine was speaking, and maybe this speaks a little bit to your question. I think we really do need to understand what's happened in Syria as being emblematic of 21st century conflicts. And by that, I mean um, uh, both the complexity of it, and we've talked about Syria, we do in other places, as being you know a three-dimensional chessboard i think we could say it's a five-dimensional chessboard we for me it's also the non-linearity of this conflict right that it kind of ebbs and flows in all kinds of ways and um it does not follow the classic phase conflict that our pentagon uses phase one phase two three it, that that doesn't apply when it comes to syria i think this is emblematic of conflicts that we will be contending with for years to come. We need to understand that um, with respect to Syria, because I think it, it teaches us a lot about where things are going. The only other comment I would be remiss if I didn't highlight, and Yassine did, but I think it bears repeating, is just the number of international norms that have been transgressed in Syria, um, with the international community essentially not really able to do much if anything about it. And now this is something I think it's not, it, sadly, it's not unique to Syria, but I think the, the breadth and the depth and the scope in which these norms have been transgressed uh, are a real 
warning sign to us all that we, we, we as an international community have a lot of work ahead of us if peace and stability, not only in Syria and in the Middle East, but quite frankly, globally are of importance. We have a lot of work to do to understand and, and rectify uh, these, uh, these deficits. Yeah, absolutely agree. Andrew? <clears throat> so general, generationally, um, to your question, it reminded me of something I learned uh, very early on for a year of my life. I worked for um, one of Asmael Assad's charities in Syria, uh, which I wrote about in my book, um, Interesting Experience. Um, what was interesting in terms of the data um, was that, you know, Asin talked earlier about the, um, the events uh, of 19, February of that led up to February of 1982. There were a series of them, uh, uh, battles between one branch of the Muslim Brotherhood and the regime. There was the bombing of ministries, attempted assassinations. Um, and then of course, culminating with February of 1982, for all of those tragedies, um, there was also the huge waves of arrests that came with it. And where Yassin pointed out, it wasn't just Islamists or suspected Islamists that were arrested, it was also communists, Nasserists, other leftists, people who had nothing to do with Muslim Brotherhood were all thrown into prison. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many of whom I got a chance to know over years besides Yassin and others. So the country was placed on lockdown. There was, the, then there was the problem with Rifat al-Assad and he, was, he had to leave the country. There is a, I believe Mustafa Talas wrote a book that was put on the shelf for about three days when I was in Syria. I don't have a copy of it, where he said that Anis al-Assad had arranged for him to leave in exchange for taking the hard currency reserves or a large amounts of the hard currency reserves from, from Syria. And the, and the country was, couldn't import many basic things, including medicine, toilet paper, which Syrians seem to be uh, reminded me of over and over and over again, tissues and other kinds of things like that. And the reason why I bring this up is that the country was placed on lockdown for about 10 years after the Hama massacre of 1982 in one way, shape or form. And also travel permits were not issued as freely. Um, Mona was there, I guess, coming out of that period of time. No, right in it. Right, right in it. Right but in but it. it was, a, you know, as she pointed out, was a very locked down society. Yeah. So the thing I learned, which was I thought was fascinating, was that actually people, when they're in the midst of something horrible like this and they're forced to stay home together with long periods of time, nothing to do, they, uh, they multiply very quickly. Syria was among the 10 fastest growing populations on the planet in yeah. terms of birth rates. So between 1982 and 1992. And so it was the waves of people born during that period of time that came to challenge the, the regime during this uprising, which I thought was, was fascinating. And the regime saw this coming. They called it the demographic bulge, but they saw it coming. The United States government, some people maybe in parts of the Warrens of the Intelligence Corps might have seen it, but it was not part of policy. We were talking about the Golan all the time, right? And, and so to your point, um, the society multiplied and the regime is, was, was rigid and these two things clashed. Um, the regime is as rigid as ever now. And it's still an open question. While we've had 500,000, maybe 600, 700,000 killed, there is also, there are other arguments and other data points that shows that actually the, the rate of reproduction in, 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 in terms of camps and other facilities is off the chart again. And that then is of course overlaid with all the political problems that are in places like Al Hol and other ones, where you have this generational rebirth of, of a traumatized populace with no end in sight, as Mona talked about. And this is, you know, I don't have solutions for that, um, but I think they're worth, they're worth focusing on. Yeah, that's really interesting. Really interesting. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, questions. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's take uh, two or three. Uh, at once to save time. So we'll start with uh, Yazid over there. Hi, uh, Yazid Sayer. Uh, pleasure to listen to you in person, Yasin. Uh, and, and I appreciate all the panelists' contributions. Um, 
I think my question relates to pretty, what pretty much all of you have said in one way or the other, but this is addressed specifically to Yassine, that going back to your notion of the neo-sultanistic form of the Assad family rule today, um, I think a big problem over the last 12 years of, for the opposition, the multiple oppositions in Syria has been to unblock the whole dynamic with the Alawi community. I mean, the regime has continued to be able to rely on that pillar. Today, I understand from also what you said about imperialism, sub-imperialism, liquid imperialism, that um, the regime survives to a large degree, thanks both to the support of Russia and Iran, but also because of the, the stalemate or the, the balance that is brought about between these different powers, external powers. But I'm interested in the domestic base of this power. As you see it today and going forwards, um, I mean, I've seen also, I can think of all sorts of reasons why the Alawi community is still trapped in a position of support for the regime. But this is also a regime that has now become more clearly, as you say, neo-sultanistic. That introduces a new dynamic and into the relationship between this regime and the Alawi community with its internal divisions and subdivisions. So I'm curious to see how you see that dynamic shifting, if ever, going mm -hmm. forward. That's a great question. Shall we take one more from the audience, if anyone has one? Right here. Hi, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Claire. I'm a Russia China analyst at Jane's Defense. Um, so last month, Xi Jinping upgraded his relationship with uh, Assad uh, to a strategic partnership, which is like a relationship he has only with a few other communities like Bolsonaro, Putin, and a few other governments around the world. Um, and we've seen a lot of Chinese investment in Syria increasing via infrastructure, 5G telecoms, you know, education, Confucius Institutes, and things like that. And I was wondering if you guys saw um, China's role in Syrian domestic politics as a potential uh, avenue, or if it will grow in the near future to give a counterbalance to the influence that Iran and Russia have in Syria, or if those concerns are like over dramatized and overblown. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Two interesting questions. So we start with the same order and we'll go across. Yassine first. Maybe the opposite. Maybe the opposite. All right then, Andrew, you're in the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, the, For once. I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about the China one. I mean, I think he, Yassine is more appropriate to address your question. Um, the Alawi opposition to the divide is an interesting one. I think really interesting. Although I think Yassine's right. Um, you know, I don't think the primary divider in, in Syria, oftentimes with people I spoke to, was sect. Although that might have been exacerbated as a result of the violence of the war. Uh, if there was one, I think it would be based on egos. But some, look, you know, a lot of politicians or people that are trying to be politicians have big egos, including in this country. So, um, you know, say, say what you want. Um, on China, my, my feeling on that, and I, I, I visited, actually I went with, this was long ago in a galaxy far, far away, I went with on, on Assad's last state visit with him to Syria, uh, to China, and had a chance to watch this up close. Uh, so a couple of things. I, I think that the Chinese don't regard him um, as that, as a serious player. Um, uh, you could see by who he was, who he went there as a part of the Asia games. Uh, he was greeted at the airport by a low level official, all these things, at least last time he flew on Syrian air, um, the 747, this time they flew him in. So it was not, you know, this wasn't great for him, but, but he had to take what he could get. Um, there's another thing about the Chinese that are, is, makes them different than the Iranians, the Russians, and maybe the Gulf Arabs to a certain extent, depending on how you look at this normalization thing, and that is they're not stupid. Uh, they want to be paid back. That's the way they make money. And if you put money into Syria, you're not going to be paid back probably anywhere, given the current situation. So therefore, I would imagine that there, unless there's a real political yield from this, and that would be something for James that probably address. What is it that the Chinese would want out of? Do they want to make it into another hub like the Iranians do? Do they want a naval base like the Russians have? Uh, do, is it like the Gulf Arabs want? Do they want to block Iran and make a pipeline or whatever the other things that have affected Syrian history over the last several decades? Um, is it the end of the Silk Road? The, mm -hmm. the new, you know, those kind of things. I think this is aspirational. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, I would say that probably these concerns are noteworthy, but overblown. 
Right. Very briefly, I, I agree with what uh, on the on, on the second question. I agree with Andrew. I would just add, you know, China is notoriously risk averse, given what's happening uh, right now, the war between Israel and Gaza, and concerns that that could well spiral into a broader regional conflagration. Uh, I, I don't see them. Uh, I think that risk averseness just went up. Um, I also think that Assad's trip was really important, more symbolically. Uh, but that we don't really see concrete results coming out of it. I have a very hard time imagining in the immediate short to even medium term, uh, China in any way, shape or form replacing certainly Iran or, or even Russia with all of its, its problems. So I, I, think, I think China's influence in some ways um, is, is a bit overblown. It's certainly worth noting. And frankly, I think from the Chinese perspective, they're far more interested in the Gulf where they, there's far more that they can they can gain in, in the short term. I'm going to take a stab at at Yazid's question, though I, I'm not nearly as as qualified as as Yassine to answer it. But it did re, what I remember, and I'd love to hear Yassine's thoughts on this. That um, in the days of Hafez al-Assad, um, the Alawites, certainly the students that I was in school with, would talk a lot about the regime electrifying their villages building roads, you didn't have the level of corruption uh, back then that you began to see and now we see in enormous uh, levels under that we see now under Bashar. And so I think that in that Syria, the, the Alawite power was, there was a popular basis in which Alawites were supporting the regime because they were seeing concrete benefits from the regime, not just in terms of military and so forth, but every day in their, in their villages. Now, as this has become more of this neo-sultanic power, it's more of a clique, a clan, um, in which the perks of power are very narrowly distributed. For, and, and the Alawites are actually suffering to an extent from how the regime is behaving. Clearly, I think this is undercutting uh, uh, the regime's influence and sway, although, again, I, I wouldn't venture further than just to offer that 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 observation. So basically, for the uh, second question you, uh, about China, I basically agree with Andrew, and I think he knows better than me about this. But to address Yazid's uh, question, uh, well, you know that the Alawite community, some 12 percent of the population were really mostly uh, poor and marginalized. So they identify with the regime, they think. And for good reasons, not maybe not services. Actually, there is a complaint, uh, a widespread complaint among the Alawites uh, in Syria is that their areas were not developed. For the, uh, and they thought, maybe this looks like a conspiracy theory, that this was done on purpose so that they go to the army and to the security. No jobs, no, no um, industry, no uh, services, uh, uh, sector, um, prosperous uh, service sector. So the only um, place for them to get jobs, to get some income is the army and security. And I, uh, well, the, the villages were electrified, yes. Um, uh, roads, and, but this was happening in the country, and it happened in early seventies. The best, um, yeah, the century, the, the decade that uh, um, rural Syria benefited from the Baathist rule, and uh, was the first decade of the first. I mean, the seven years before Hamas it came to power, then um, some few years after Hamas it came to power. So I don't think that they benefited in a specific way from it. But they, look, um, apart from powerful victimhood narrative among the Alawites, and that was nurtured by the regime, not openly, apart from this, they, um, and apart from the clientel, uh, the networks of clientelism. Sectarianism is not about religion and about, about uh, about affiliations, about committees, about 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 gains and about clientelism. When you are from this community, and it is easier for you to get to get help and getting a passport, or and um, uh, having a job or something, it is 
this solves so many problems in a country that has been de-bureaucratized and delegalized. I, I mean, we don't have a, um, a legal, a, an, an efficient legal system. Actually, it was beautified and uh, destroyed, uh, basically. So everything can be solved by WASTA. Yeah. Right. And you, who's the WASTA? The WASTA is the officer, your, your, your cousin who's a, an important officer or so among the Alawites is mostly officers. It is mostly people with stars on their shoulders. Among the Christians, it is mostly rich people or bishops. Mm. Among the Druze, I guess the same. Maybe not rich people, some officers and the religious leaders. This is the problem of the Sunnis. The network, the clientelist network is very weak. Hmm. So uh, they don't have wastas. Not efficient, not uh, not many officers. Uh, they are weak, and the ministers are very just uh, just uh, officials without real power. So this is the second thing. Uh, victimhood narrative. Um, uh, this these networks of uh, of wasta. Then they were targeted by the Islamists mm-hmm. in late nineteen seventies, and in um, Amman. The massacre, the first genocidal massacre in Syria was Madras al Madfa'iya, the mm-hmm. artillery school in Aleppo, 1979. Mm-hmm. And this pushed, this led to identification. Then, fourth, the, the effect of 53 years in power. Mm-hmm. Um, as a, a, a young communist in those times, I observed, it was observable that many of the youth from the Alawite community were revolutionary, were socialists, were uh, were defending um, socialist ideals. Now they are far more conservative. If you read Adonis in 1970s, 60s and 70s, and you read him today, he's almost a fascist now. This is the effect of 53 years of privilege. The privilege. When you have privilege, you become conservative. The more you have privilege, you become conservative. I, I think I think this is easy to understand in the US. So yeah, I guess this is... Uh, and the destruction of political organizations has, has made it... Um, um, more, Difficult for many Alawite youth to find alternatives, mm-hmm. viable alternatives. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, now in the last few uh, months, more voices are very radical against the regime. Uh, you find some of them on YouTube, and one of them was arrested. He was going to Sweden mm-hmm. and was arrested, and he disappeared mm-hmm. uh, almost two uh, months ago. They 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 named Bashar al-Assad as the enemy. They talk to the Alawite community to liberate itself and, and that you, you Alawite, have been uh, 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 um, victimized by the regime more than you were victims in the past. And this is true. Maybe 100,000 of Alawite youth were, have been killed in the last 12 years and a half. Gosh, okay, we've tackled a lot and I've really li- literally just noticed we're out of time. I thought we had some more time left, but um, time flies when... You're having fun talking about very difficult subjects. Um, thank you so much uh, to everyone for, for joining us here in person uh, and online. Thank you so much, Yasin, and to Mona and to Andrew. I think we've uh, had a fascinating conversation here, touching on a lot of uh, issues and angles that maybe we don't typically uh, here at some a place like MEI, but I'm really glad we have. Um, and so for now, uh, thanks again for, for being here. Tune in. MEI has a lot of very good uh, and interesting events coming up. And obviously there's a lot going on in the region. So uh, look forward to keeping in touch.